Okay, so welcome to the second session today. Um, it's a real, real um, <clears throat> honor and privilege, and um, it was very meaningful actually to me to have uh, someone um, with us today who's somewhat of a, who's a personal hero of mine. Um, because for, for me, Josh Tetrick over here, the founder of um, founder and CEO of Just Foods, um, is someone who uh, I think is a deep philosopher and a deep thinker, and who um, and who's really tried hard to apply that philosophy in the real world and make a, make a really meaningful difference. Um, I think John Burnside was talking yesterday about the identity of systems. Uh, and particularly the environment and what we're doing to the environment. Um, and so Josh is an absolute, potentially for me, actually unique example of someone who, uh, who comes from a real conviction um, about saving that and really has a, has a unique way of translating that into business. So um, welcome, Josh Tetrick. Thanks, Jacob. Um, I thought what we'd do is to give everyone a little bit of a sense of what you guys do adjust, which is quite difficult because they do a lot. Um, and then maybe a move into uh, a sort of more personal sense, potentially, of what drives you and, and what, what, what the ideas are behind the company. Um, so from my limited understanding of what you guys are doing, um, it can sort of be separated into two categories. Um, one is the egg product that you've been developing, so uh, plant-based egg solutions. Um, of which I think some of you tried some this morning. Um, and then the second is um, also super interesting, uh, cultured meat or clean meat. And I'm not sure if you guys have heard of this, but we'll talk about what that is um, in a bit as well. So I thought maybe we'll start, because we've had it this morning, uh, we'll start with, um, with what you guys have been doing with, with eggs. Yeah. Um, and maybe if you can just give us a little sense of the scale of, of what you've been up to. Um, and, and the kind of impact it's been having. Good deal. Um, good to be here. Thank you for trying it earlier. Hope it was all right. Um, well, under, underneath, underneath the whole thing, um, before we get to the, the products, is, I think, uh, an acknowledgement that the food system today, whether it's what we have for breakfast uh, here, uh, what I had for breakfast growing up in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, what someone's eating in Monrovia, Liberia today, the food system does not, in total, represent our values for any number of different reasons. Um, the environmental reasons are pretty obvious. The, the, the dominance of animals in our food system uh, makes it so that over 40% of the climate change emissions even more than all the transportation sources combined come from the animals we eat. And most of the animals we eat are not free-range reindeer that I saw last night, but a much more intensive kind. But it's not just an animal thing. It's not just a climate change thing. About a billion people tonight are going to bed hungry. And I think often when we think about the food system and how we might want to change the food system, um, it's important to understand that too. About 2.1 billion people are not going to bed hungry, but they suffer from something called micronutrient deficiency, which is called hidden hunger. You can't really see it in their face, but you can see it in their lack of brain development. Um, you got the rise of chronic disease, heart disease, and cancer. So all this stuff is in the food system that we don't really think about every day. And um, I, I grew up um, in, a, in a pretty uh, ugly food system in Birmingham, Alabama. It was tasty sometimes. My, uh, my, I grew up relatively poor, and I grew up on cinnamon rolls out of vending machines and nachos and cheese from a 7-Eleven right up the street from me and chicken sandwiches from Burger King. Um, we didn't have a whole lot of money, and my mom you know, did what she could, and that's how I ate. But I was eating a way that wasn't really serving my body, certainly not serving the planet, but it's what we could afford. So um, after, after going to college, spent a little bit of time in Africa, I decided that maybe we should do something about it and started this company called Just. Uh, and the purpose of it is to create a more just food system, uh, a food system where the food that tastes really good is also the food that's good for you, is also the food that's good for the planet, and also the food you can actually afford. 
Um, and we decided, Jacob, to start with breakfast and see if we could figure out a way to create this mo the most uh, ubiquitous animal protein uh, on the planet, the egg, and see if we could find a plant that would actually do some of the things the egg would do, but use a lot less land and a lot less water, and maybe we wouldn't need the animal. Um, hired a big research and development team, took about four and a half years to find this bean called the mung bean. Uh, finally found it, and it turns out, even though the mung bean's been in the food system since 2600 BC, um, the damn thing actually scrambles like an egg. Um, <laughs> And it's, 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 it's still extraordinary to say that uh, we, went, we went through uh, thousands and thousands of different species of plants to see if one could figure a way to do it, and, and the, mung bean, uh, the mung bean did, and we're fortunate to have all that, uh, that product called Just Egg all across the United States. We just launched with a big fast food chain called Tim Hortons in Canada. We're on JD.com and Tmall in China. We've sold about the equivalent of 10 million uh, chicken eggs as of today, and this is our first full year. <laughs> Uh, selling it. Um, you can find all the major retailers in the U.S. You can find it right in the egg section. Now, one of the things I'm most proud about, though, is um, over 70% of the people who buy it are not vegan or vegetarian. And it's a point that I want to emphasize that perfection, um, I think, is talked about often in the food system. You got, you know, let's, let's be vegan or, you know, let's eat meat. But we have a different perspective, and the perspective is about being a little bit better. Um, so I, I love when, when, when people who are not just strict vegans or vegetarians decide to eat a little bit of it. That, that's an important thing. And then the second big thing that we're working on is around meat. Um, and for meat, we decided not to find a plant that would scramble like an egg, but instead to find cells and animals, and we'll show you a little video of this, um, that without needing the animal, without needing a cow to consume all the soy and corn and to grow muscle and fat on the cow's bones for two years and consume a lot of resources, that we could figure out a way, starting with beef, uh, to make it in a much more sustainable way, in a way that I think aligns much more with our values. Um, and that is, as Jacob said, that's the, that's the cultured uh, clean meat deal. Um, so we do those two things, but again, undergirding this whole thing is, how do you figure out a way through a different approach uh, a values-based approach, a technology-driven approach to just make this food system a little bit better. Great. Um, that's pretty impressive, by the way. Um, um, I guess maybe before, I mean, maybe let's, let's, let's because you've just talked about yeah. it, let's maybe show people the, something of what you're doing with the, with the meat. Let's do it. We've all been there, right? In the grocery store. Oh, I'll just buy this meat, and there it is, and all we have to do is buy it. We don't have to think about what it took to make that chicken in, in that nice packaging. But the reality of the way that it came about, it's incredibly unsustainable. And that's one of the biggest problems facing humanity right now. But we figured out a way to solve it. The whole idea is that that chicken in itself has an unlimited source of itself and there is a way where you can take just a handful of cells and keep growing them essentially infinitely. For those very first cells, it was important to us how we got the cells, not just that we got the cells. We came up with the idea to use one feather from the single best chicken that we could find. We picked out a really nice looking chicken that had a really nice clean white feathers, and a healthy comb and waddle. Caleb happened to have the infrastructure to create a new chicken coop. So we put our special little chicken in there. My first reaction to this project was like, what are these people doing? That's kind of weird. But in all honesty, people are gonna eat meat and one feather from one of my chickens could be the catalyst that feeds the world.
first thing we need to do is we need to identify a cell that we are going to use as the basic starter material. And then what we need to do is find a food for it to grow in. So we have to identify the right set of nutrients that will cause the cells to multiply, but not just multiply, but do so quickly and into high densities. Those nutrients are gonna be obtained from plants. Animals in nature eat plants, right? And I don't think that there's another company that has this extensive knowledge base and experience with plants and their protein components that will also be able to test this in actually growing cells. It's a perfect extension to apply the data that we get from those discoveries and using them in ways that we've never seen used before in the world. One of the biggest points of comparison between what we're doing and the old way of doing things is food safety. And when you make that comparison, the difference is staggering. To eat real, actual meat without causing all this harm to the planet and to animals, that's what clean meat is. The chicken was handed off to me, and for this first prototype, I said to myself, I'm going to make the best chicken nuggets ever. Wake up, wake up. I want to lift you up. I want to dress you up. Let's be friends. It was an out-of-body experience to sit there and, and eat a chicken, but have the chicken that you're eating running around in front of you. You don't imagine doing something like that. But then you have this realization that we've figured out how life really works and now we don't need to cause death in order to create food. And we're gonna have to do it if we wanna continue living on this planet. Let it load and we can... Uh... I, I'll explain the content. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, what I, what I find so fascinating is that, especially with a meat product, um, in a way, you know, it combines three things which are probably amongst the most pressing um, problems to be solved in the world. Um, as you were saying, you know, malnutrition, people being, well, one starving, but also the people who do eat meat often um, eating rubbish meat, meat stuff with antibiotics. Um, and that's obviously something that, that we'll see in a second, but you, you want to be addressing with, with clean meat. The second being a huge deal for me, which is why I have, although I do eat meat, um, find it very challenging sometimes, is, is animal ethics and knowing what we do to animals and how uh, horrific their, their, their lives are. Um, and thirdly, the environment. Um, and uh, I think, I'm not sure if it's in this clip, but if you could maybe also give it just a sense of the scale of, yeah. of the difference that, that you could be achieving. So take these three huge things, you know, animal ethics, um, you know, welfare of, of people eating meat and, uh, and the environment, and boil it down into one concrete product that's yeah. actually tangible. Um, and that, I, I just, I've always found that fascinating because it's a, it's a real, it's a real thing that actually all these sort of more abstract loose things we'd love to be doing, like better you know, ourselves or, or help out the environment, somehow it's actually all possible with that product. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, if you, I mean, just factually, if we all just say, all right, you know, what are, what are the facts of meat production that we can just, everyone can agree on? About a billion animals are killed every single year. Again, about 40% of the emissions, more than transportation, uh, come from the animals we eat. Again, not the cars we drive, but the animals we eat. 99% of animals, again, aren't like those reindeers. They're cooped up in tiny little cages. We feed more food to the animals we eat than the billion people that are going to bed hungry every single night. It's not a good system, right? It's not, it's hard to argue, you know, it's not a good system. And the question is, well, what does one do about it, right? Now, what one can do is just eat plants, whole plants, and that's an incredibly effective way, I think, to live. I think it's actually maybe the healthiest way to live. The problem is, it's really hard to convince human beings living uh, in the developed or the developing world just to do that. Now, are there more people become vegan vegetarian? Certainly. But we live in a world where even good people are not perfect, right? Um, it's better to walk than to get in an electric car, but we still you know, might get an electric car. 
Um, so the question is, you, you convince a whole lot of people to become veg vegan vegetarian. Do you encourage people just to eat, quote, sustainable meat? The problem with more sustainable meat is it's really expensive, and it's hard to commercialize that for most people in the world. So for us, this doesn't mean it's the perfect option, but we think potentially one of the options to solve this thing is let's figure out a way to give people the meat they want, right? Uh, as you said, non-rubbish meat, meat in a way that, that's free of antibiotics. It could taste good, and it could be a part, maybe not in the entire deal, but a part of solving this big challenge. And um, this was uh, actually mentioned by <laughs> Churchill back in the day as a long-term solution even before the, the technology uh, was out there. But uh, the technology is really about taking a cell from an animal. It could be the root of a feather. It could be a biopsy. It could be a fresh piece of meat. It could be from a, uh, a high-end cow in Japan or a, a chicken in Northern California like the one that you're going to see. Um, separating in from the animal's body and then identifying nutrients for that cell to grow it. And the technology exists long-term to be able to feed the planet in that way. Now, the problem is, it just sounds fucking weird. <laughs> it just sounds weird, right? No matter how many times I say it, it just is weird, right? So how do you, how do you deal with, man, that just, it's just weird. Our way, our way of dealing with it is say, well, we don't know another better, well, I'm not sure what another option is. We kind of got to just deal with the weirdness head on. Um, an another way is we, we decide to partner with, uh, with farmers in Japan or Patagonia, for example, um, who, uh, who, who raise their animals in particular sustainable ways, bring them apart uh, into the process, um, show, uh, show the world eventually that that's where we're getting uh, the cells from, have these farmers talk about it themselves, separate it from the lab environment, uh, and, and explain that the, the, uh, the, the cell actually starts on the farm. Um, and then ultimately make it taste so good and be so affordable that that counterbalances the weirdness that naturally comes with it. What are, what are the latest names that you have for it? Is it? Oh, I hate the names for it, Jacob. The name, so people call this uh, lab-grown meat. People call it cultured meat. People call it clean meat. People call it uh, overly engineered meat. People call it, you know, meat I never want to eat. <laughs> people call it all different stuff. Uh, what, what I think in the future is um, I think we're going to have a world where the vast majority of the meat that people consume will be this, and there'll be a smaller percentage for folks that can afford it of call it the high-end reindeer meat, right? That'll be, that'll be a part of it, but I think the vast majority of the world um, needs to be able to afford something that's cleaner uh, and afford something that actually supports the environmental systems that we have. So that's my bet, and, and hopefully in the future it'll just be called meat. And, and if I understand correctly, even though you know a lot of us in this room, I think, are kind of vegan or uh, you know vegan or vegetarian, and, and we um, and we sense that we're we're doing something good for the planet. Overall, meat consumption is still rising. Yeah, that's the thing that's that's the thing that is both um, I think both uh, you know startling. There, there's an optimistic side, whereas it feels like on one hand there's a rise of people getting it. Right on one hand, we see. More companies like ours popping up, um, and, I, and I, I hope there'll be more and more. We see more vegan and vegetarian restaurants. We see more eat plants at this restaurant or that. That's a fact. But as you said, at the same time, more people will eat meat today than will have eaten meat yesterday. More people will eat tomorrow than will have eaten today. And that's because one simple fact, people are rising up out of poverty. And when you ride, I spent some time in Africa, when you get a little bit more of your paycheck, you're going to get some meat. The poorest folks in the world are not eating a lot of meat. When you get a little bit more money, you eat more meat. It actually turns out when you reach a certain income level, it plateaus and then dips, probably like some of the folks in this room. But that's, that's part of the, you know, the, the dawning challenge of it. Um, and we need to figure out a way not to solve the meat problem just for the folks in this room, right? But how do you solve the meat problem when China's rising, when Sub-Saharan Africa's rising, when Latin America's rising? We've got to figure out a way to feed those folks, something that, that, that makes sense long term. Mm. Another part of the challenge of it, and this is a, this is a, a struggle that I have, um, probably my, my biggest motivator, this is personally, and everyone in my company has a different motivator, is why cause pain when you don't need to? As simple as that. 
It's actually non-environmental things for me personally. I'm passionate about the environment. I think climate change needs to be addressed. But personally, if you don't need to cause pain, why do it? That is not a good selling point, though. <laughs> right? And I even resist saying it. I'm saying it here. But, you know, if you went on our website, you wouldn't see that anywhere. You wouldn't see that in our marketing materials for Just Egg. Um, and it's a struggle that I have because it's something I want to, I was asking whether this thing is filmed or not, but it's, it's all good. Um, it's something I, it can alienate people when you say that. Eating is a very sensitive subject, and eating animals is, like I think, the most sensitive of the subjects of eating. And it can feel very much like, don't tell me how to eat, man. Um, don't get into my business in that way. But you know, listen, for me, the root of this is why well, cause pain if you don't need to. Can you, can you talk a bit maybe about the kind of the pattern of, of identity that you've been coming up against? You know, I guess yeah. you sort of started just to touch on it. But I know that yeah. you've... Um, there's, there was even, I was uh, at one point slightly concerned about you, I was about to call you because I saw all these, you know, when he did the sort of the, the, the um, egg thing first, all these sort of chicken farmers were like not having it and we're going to, you know, come after you for we're taking your business. It. And so that's obviously one as a sort of personal, but, but what's the sort of deeper underlying kind of identity that you're, you, that you're really trying to challenge? Yeah. So there are a few things. I think one is, um, you know, I think a lot about, how I grew up. When I, when I was growing up in Birmingham, Alabama, if someone said, you should think about being a vegan, I mean, that, that would be, you know, that is, that is the antithesis of the identity that I wanted to have growing up. It, the word vegan and all of the things that comes along with that in my head growing up is exactly the opposite of the man that I wanted to be. And that, I think that word is actually a big problem. Mm. Um, again, especially, not, not necessarily for this room, but especially for the vast majority of people that we're trying to, we're trying to figure out a way to, to feed a little bit better. So our thoughts on that is, forget about the word vegan, right? Talk about, talk about food that you know, tastes really good, that's good for you, that ultimately is really affordable. Uh, don't call this lab-grown meat, call it meat. And I think trying to figure out a way to get the people who, um, who are repelled by the idea of vegan to eat in a way that reflects the underlying values of veganism is what I want to do. Second thing, though, is you're right. We, we used to have egg companies come after us. We had a, a big campaign by the American Egg Board, which is a lobbying organization for the egg industry in the United States, come at us. Um, some dude from the American Egg Board threatened to put a hit out on me. It was fucking crazy, all the stuff that happened. Um, but, um, but, uh, when I, when I first started the company, I thought, I thought these big egg and meat and milk companies, you know, were, were a bunch of bastards that didn't care at all. And we should do everything we can to, you know, put them out of business. That's what I thought. Right. Um, it turns out that as I've gotten to know some executives at big egg and meat and dairy companies, we, we share a common interest and that interest is they want to make a lot of money selling protein. Their dogma is not, I want to cram animals in tiny little cages, and I want to make money selling those animals. Their dogma is, I want to be a big business, I want to be around for a long time, I want to go public or stay public, I want my quarter earnings to increase, I want to get a bigger house, I want to get more, that's their dogma. Um, and what we've been able to do is actually figure out a way to work with them. So our best partners now, our egg companies. So we're going to be launching in Europe with a big company called Eurovo. They're the biggest egg processor here in Europe. And they're taking sort of the core protein that makes up Just Egg, adding oil and water to it and pushing it out under Just Egg. So the kind of the theory of change there, Jacob, is that the current food system is awful as I think it is, as horrendous for the environment and our bodies as I think it is. It's actually really, really good at getting food to you. It's good at mixing and processing and warehousing and distribution. And that infrastructure that brings a lot of, I think, pain to the world is still bringing things to the world. So our theory here is figure out a different approach and plug it into that existing infrastructure, help these folks make a little bit of money, and you know, maybe that's, that's a better way of, mm. of getting at something. 
I think maybe one last question before we'll open it up to, uh, to the floor. Um, you started this in 2011, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you had a certain set of ideas and, and ideals about what you're doing and why you're doing. Um, can you tell us what they were? And also now that, that we're in 2019, sort of eight years later, how has that shifted or changed mm. and how has it changed you? Um, well, personally, I, I had this, this thought growing up in Alabama, like a, a guy in Alabama, if he's like halfway athletic, he thinks he's going to be a professional football player. So that was my, that was my deal growing up. And I, I, I realized pretty quickly when I got to college, I wasn't, I wasn't good enough to do that. And I, I didn't know where to put all my energy. Um, and I, I didn't, the, the direction I had for my life suddenly wasn't there and I needed something to focus on and it took me to Africa. I was doing a little bit of work with kids and what, what is very sustaining for me when we first started and sustaining for me today is waking up and knowing that I'm throwing my energy into something that is creating meaningful change. Um, in a way that is real, in a way that you can touch, um, in a way that you can smell, uh, in a way that's alleviating suffering, that's alleviating pain, um, and in a way that sometimes people that buy it don't even know it. Um, so that's it's one thing that I think is the same from the moment I started till now, that um, it's good not to feel directionless, you know? It's good to try to find you know, one or two things that you might be decent at and throw it into something that, that is really worthwhile. The mission of the company is still the same. It's try to figure out a way to build a better food system. Try to make it actually easy for people to eat well. Don't assume people are bad. Um, people, if we can try to figure out a way to make it a little bit easier for good people to do the right thing, then they'll probably do it. If we make it hard for good people to do the right thing, they probably won't. I just think that's a, that's a fact of life. And that stays with us. Um, and it's been, it is, it has been hard. It has been a challenge. We've had a lot of, a lot of crazy stuff uh, happen to us. But, you know, through it all, we got 120 people all around the world that wake up every day, different motivations um, to, to, try to, to try to do something. So it's, it's been uh, something I'm pretty grateful for. Great. Well, I think if, um, if we got some questions from the audience, I think we have a few. Um, yeah, maybe start with the front charity and, and move backwards. Yeah. Did you like the egg all right, Charity, first? Okay, okay, okay. Did it taste like an egg? Hello. Um, did, did, you find, did you find, be honest, did it, what was different between that and the It didn't taste exactly like egg, but it was pretty near. Okay. And I really enjoyed it. Okay. And I really enjoyed that it was made of mung beans <laughs> and the history of that. Um, I would make a distinction, quite obviously, between the two different products. One is not, pre it is pretending to be egg, but it's just not made of egg. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing is pretending to be meat, but it is in some part made of meat. Yeah. So my first question is, what exactly is the new product? Yeah. My second question is, um, related to my anxiety around um, a completely different product, which is robotics, <laughs> or robots, mm. particularly the use of a servant in one's house, like Alexa, Siri. Mm. It's a robot, but we humanize it. Mm. And in, in one way, I wonder why you want to like an animalify the new product if it mm. isn't really an animal. My reservation would be in eating that product is that it doesn't have a natural life. And although I don't like the idea of killing an animal, there's something in the value of the animal growing up within the environment that I also share and what that might yeah. give me. So. I question what the actual product is and also what the repercussions of um, commodifying that and what our relationship to then real meat might be. Yeah. Um, I've never heard that term. You said animalify. <laughs> animalify. Um, the, I think that's right. And we are, that's a good way of expressing it. We are trying to animalify a mung bean. Um, I think the... The reason that we do it and the reason we, we call it Just Egg, I, th I don't think it is rooted in what will increase the probability for 
non-vegans and vegetarians to eat it because the eating of it to me is the most relevant metric. How do I get more human beings to eat it, eat it in a restaurant, um, you know, buy it, uh, and, and eat it at home. And I think the vast majority of human beings on the planet are probably not thinking about the world in the way that you're thinking about the world. Um, I think you're thinking about the world much more through a sustainability prism than I think, I think most are. So that's, that's the primary reason we're doing it. If you told me right now not animalifying it could actually increase the probability that more people would buy it, I'd call my team right after this and let's uh, switch it up. So that, that's really what it gets at. Now, with that said, I do think there's an opportunity um, to even make it better. So a good example would be eggs don't have a lot of antioxidants. Um, and there's a lot of evidence around the role of antioxidants and breaking up free radicals and mitigating oxidation and how that ultimately helps to mitigate chronic disease. We want to put some antioxidants in that. Um, eggs are not necessarily loaded with micronutrients. We want to put micronutrients in ours. So I think I'd like to ultimately make it better in important respects, but have it close enough to the animal that even people that don't necessarily care about the environment want to eat it. Now on, on the, the cultured meat piece, what is the product? So we have, um, we have multiple cell lines. So we have a chicken cell line, we have a beef cell line. And I'll, I'll, focus, on, uh, I'll focus on the beef because um, we might watch the, the chicken film. Um, we got cells from Wagyu cows in Japan. We then brought those cells back to our headquarters. We then identified nutrients and plants to feed those cells. In the same way those cows would consume soy or corn or grass and nutrients would go into their body and muscle and fat would uh, grow on their bones for two years. We're trying to do that without the animal. Uh, and the end product that we'll release sometime in the future will be a Wagyu hamburger that didn't require the killing of a single animal. Um, I totally hear your point of, but the animal didn't go through the, the whole process that we're used to. And I do think there will be a certain subset of people who will always want an animal that goes through that process that we're used to. So as, we, so as long as we all realize that the process that we're used to, if we actually really saw into it, is pretty appalling. Um, so ultimately, I think the future is, I think most of the meat will be meat made in this way, simply because it's the most efficient way to make meat. And I think there'll be a smaller percentage of meat made in a more in a more traditional in a more traditional sense. I'm, I'm really interested in the idea of uh, how close meat eating is to people's national identity. Mm. And a really good that's a big one. A really good example of this is in the UK. We have a chain of shops called Greg's. Greg's. Yeah, okay. and it's kind of a um, I don't know how you describe it. It's like kind of a sandwich shop. It sells meat pies, sausage rolls, mm. kind of like everyday working food, working okay. people's food. You copy, you get a yep, bag. Yep, yep. And they recently produced a vegan sausage roll. Hmm. Um, and the outrage among the more conservative oh press was like it was, uh, it had, you know, sent a knife into yeah. the British, wow. Britishness of the, of the population. What they say? It, it, was, it was just the idea that it was really, a th it, was, it was a bit of threat. I, d I think the British people here will remember <laughs> this, right? It was such a threat to Britishness, the vegan sausage roll. Huh. Um, as it is, Greg <laughs> probably did get very much the last laugh because it, it sold out. You couldn't buy one after 10 o'clock in the morning because people were loving it. Wow. But what was really interesting, and we're talking about identity here, yeah. is the vegan sausage roll became <clears throat> a sign of what was happening to British culture. The un-Britishing of British culture <laughs> was, was in this vegan sausage roll. So interesting. I wonder if, if you kind of have come across a lot of these really close cultural ties to meat, yeah. which has really nothing to do with anything yeah. practical. Well, you're making me scared to launch Just Egg in the UK before the interview. <laughs> have to work that out a little bit. 
Stay away, conservative press, from that. Um, it is, you know, I think food, there, there are a handful of differences between food and, and other industries, and, and one is exactly what you said. Food is a very personal thing. Food, unlike software on a phone or unlike electric cars, are very much a part of the stories that we tell about ourselves, about our ethnicity, about our nationality, about who we are. Right. I, I remember in Alabama getting off, I was going to this middle school called Chelsea Middle School. I'd get off the bus and my mom would have a plate of uh, uh, grits, chicken wings, butter, collard greens, and like broken up bacon. And when I think about those things, I think about loving my mom. It's connected to that, you know? Um, so I think one is not acknowledging that identity is a big deal. And if you don't deal with it in, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in a meaningful way, I don't think you're going to solve it. That's one thing. Um, now the question is, how do, you, how do you then you deal with it? What, what, what does that mean? And I think, um, I, think, I think there are two ways to think about it. I think the first way to think about it is you can create new stories, right? You don't just have to rely on the old stories. You can create new stories around plant-based eggs or that vegan sausage roll and how my mom, you know, got me that. Um, so you, the stories don't always have to be the same damn stories. You can, you can create new stories. And then the second way to think about it is how do you figure out a way to create this, to have this new approach also sit within the identity of the past? So an example of what we're thinking around the meat is um, the, the, the premier product that we're working on is this Wagyu beef. Uh, and this farm that we work with has been making Wagyu beef for three generations. So we're trying to figure out a way, and we're a long way from doing this right, but trying to figure out a way to tap into that sort of generational history around that, that generational mastery around that, the, the love of beef, the connection to the land of beef, but just in a completely new format. Now, we still might get taken on by the conservative press in Britain, <laughs> right? But it's the best way at least we know how to do it. But I... I do think if, if that's not acknowledged and not thought through, I think you end up having a tiny little impact. And it's, uh, uh, it's a really good question. There are hardly any conservatives in the room, by the way, just so you know. So. That's all right. That's that's all right. right. And the Perfect. sausage rolls were very popular, so they do take heart. It, that's people good. People will eat it. it will yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> okay, Iman and then Nell. Thanks. This is so interesting. I work at The Guardian, so the, you know, the core Guardian values, they're always talking a lot about these stories. It's massive. Um, but it's really interesting um, because you were talking about how people look at vegans and the kind of associations that people have around vegans. And I've had a look at your website and I find it really interesting that it's super stripped back. It's all black and white. Even the kind of short video, the mission statement video, it's like, it's a bit like... Um, not, but, but I don't want to say like an Apple video, more like a Samsung video. So it's oh, all about. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I've got an Android, so okay, um, okay, I'm, all yeah, right, I'm doing right, Samsung, fine. but um, it's it's very. I'm gonna call my filmmaker up after this. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very kind of focused on um, technology, right? And so that video is really interesting to me because it doesn't go anywhere near those kinds of things that people think about when they think of the word vegan. And so I, I did want to know a bit more about the branding mm. and how you approach that and what role you think you have in terms of branding, mm. you know, meat-free options. Yeah. Because I think that, you know, you obviously play a massive part in, in making people see it as something actually quite aspirational, uh, mm. you know, just looking at the way that it's all been, yeah. been done on your website. So I just wanted to ask you to develop a bit more on that thing yeah. of branding and your role in that space. Yeah, well, I'll so when, when, we st when we started the company seven years ago, um, the idea of even, of even using the term plant-based, um, I would have um, I would have been against. Um, I might have said, we use a bean and then the bean does this thing, but I would avoid phrases like made from plants or plant-based or vegan, thinking that that's going to turn off most people. Now, what's really interesting, um, and maybe we should change our website to reflect this, is over the last couple of years, um, it's actually become more acceptable and I think less offensive. So much so that we, we found sometimes, and we do little experiments on this, if we emphasize the fact that Just Egg is made from plants, we really crank up the volume on the made from plant stuff, 
we actually sell more. Um, now, what is also interesting is part of our kind of theory of change here is we don't want to sell just to sell to vegans and vegetarians. In fact, we want that to be a very small percentage of the people that we sell to. Um, when we do uh, demos in store or have uh, events to give people our product, even we did it for you, we'll often mix it with animal products. Our chef, Michael, I don't know if you know, he, had, he was putting some cheese in that omelet, and that's intentional. Um, now, sometimes we take a lot of hell from the vegans out there because we do that, because it's not, quote, pure, but we would rather be effective than, than be pure. But the aspirational piece is a, is a big deal. I think right now, the majority of our consumers are actually uh, women between 21 and 50 who care about health and wellness, um, who, when you dig deep into the psychology and the psychographic uh, traits of, of how they're living their life, they're like, I just want you a little bit better. And attempting to speak to them uh, in, a, uh, in, in a more aspirational way is what we typically try to tap into. Now, part of the frustration that I have with that is I want to sell to everyone right now, right? I don't want to just sell to women between 20 and 50 who care about health and wellness and sustainability. But, you know, there's a sequence of things that you got to do before you, before you do everything. Um, but, yeah, we do, we do try to avoid the word vegan. Um, we do try to focus on aspirational elements. And we do very much try to sell to people who eat animal products, and try to find that line around just eat a little bit better, not, not around eating perfect. Um, but we need to work on our Samsung-centric video, though. <laughs> I thought it was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now and then, Dominique. Thank you. Um, God, I've got almost too much to say. Um, the first thing, I grew up in the countryside. Mm. Uh, learned to milk a cow knew everything about farming and bringing up animals in an old-fashioned way. Yeah. I've had chickens myself. Um, I think there's a huge polarisation between town and country, and I think it's worldwide. I think it taps into class as well. And I mm. think using language like good is a very interesting choice, that you've said good, I think, three times so far this morning, maybe two. Um, the people who are good, it's not that you eat well, we are good. And I think that that's a judgment which I'm deeply uncomfortable with. Um, coming from that background and thinking that those people, therefore, are not good. Because if these are the good eaters, the rest of the eaters are bad. And I think that's pretty problematic for me. You know, it's sort mm. of alienating all those people. So that's I, an ju observation. Ju just to clarify that, I, mm. I might have misspoke. I, my, my perspective on this is that people are inherently good. That, that, that human beings out there, including myself, that might, um, might trip up when it comes to not being as sustainable as I want to be, or my friends in Alabama who might not be eating in a way that I you know, consider the most sustainable. I think people are inherently good. And I think the problem that the food system presents is we make it really easy for good people. Again, 99% of the people on the planet to eat in a way that doesn't represent their intrinsic values, their intrinsic values of kindness, of compassion, of integrity. I think those are intrinsic values. And part of the reason I think it's intrinsic is, I think a, my, my, my brother just had a, a little girl named June. Um, and um, I'm not sure how he's gonna raise her plant-based or not. Uh, but I can tell you, um, June loves animals. And when June becomes three, four, five, and she sees a chicken nugget or she sees one of those conventional sausages at Greg's, you said, she's not, there's going to be a disassociation. There's a disconnect. That's always, that's always been the between case. Between that, but yeah. I guess my point is people are inherently good. We just make it damn hard for them to do the right but that's, thing. That's a huge assumption. That's all I, it was just an observation about language and assumptions mm. around language. And that polarization that interests me between town and country. Mm. So for me, well, I'm saying the country folks are good though too. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not saying. But there's an ancient relationship between us and natural food. So it's really interesting that this morning the egg was delicious. Uh, it's not egg; it's mung bean, and it was absolutely delicious. I really liked it. But there's something interesting for me to eat a product which is branded that says just egg on it. It is yeah. an egg, and yeah. it's saying just egg. 
and it was in a plastic bottle. Yeah. And when I asked about the plastic bottle, I mean, an egg has always been an organic product which is naturally biodegradable. But it's a technical question I wanted to ask. It's, you know, I'm not berating you for that, but I did, mm. when I said, well, why is it in a plastic bottle? I was told, oh no, we're developing a Tetra Pak, but a Tetra Pak is also, so my question mm. actually is technical, is about biodegradable packaging. Mm. And how long can you have a liquid in biodegradable packaging? How much does that cut into the profits? And therefore, are you a profit only company or are you actually use it uh, is it a profit only company which you don't need to answer i can find out but how that you know it's not just the morality around good food it's the morality around is the idea that we're going to be able to feed more poor people because it, a lot of there's a lot of talk about branding anyway so many so many things mm. in there sorry so I, I want far I'll, too much to say I, today. I want i want i want to make sure i caught your point on feeding poor people the the what's the the question around that whether it's a profit-only company or whether there is um, a big sort of humanitarian I got it. thinking behind it. I got it. I got it. Okay. Maybe I'll start with that one first. So I, um, I, I make sure before we, we've been fortunate enough to raise a lot of capital, about $250 million from some very well-known investors. And I make it a practice of before I, I take uh, any capital to tell investors exactly what I believe in. Um, and what the company is about and what that is is we want to do things that increase the probability that more people are eating in a way that reflects our values to build a food system uh, we want to make our small contribution to a food system that is healthier tastes a little bit better is not so painful to animals um, it isn't so degrading to the planet that is the focus now focusing on that and building that unequivocally requires making money. There's no doubt about it. I used to work in the world of nonprofits, and I, I think they're an incredible array of effective nonprofits. I personally felt it was ineffective for me. Um, so I got into business not because I studied business or my dad's in business. I only got into business because I thought it'd be the most effective way to, for me to do something meaningful. Um, so that that's what we're about. Um, we shouldn't be in plastic. It, it has to do with a uh, I, I give you a bunch of silly excuses about this is the first full year that we're doing it, but mostly they're bullshit excuses. We're, we're, we're moving a, to paper globally. Um, there is some issues around shelf life related to it, but again, it's a... That's what I was going to ask, it, and it is tied into profit, because what I can't understand, I mean, I know there's biodegradable packaging, but it's how much we're stopping using it because of profit. But I, I, mm. it was a really interesting technical question about liquids, because you can, if, it can be, it can, it, it can, can be, it can be in paper. It, it just, yeah, it has, it has to do with the, the manufacturing facility we started out on, and we wanted to get it out sooner rather. Because Pack has plastic lining, doesn't it, and metallic lining. That's, yeah, it's not totally biodegradable. I wouldn't put it in my compost tape, frankly. We, uh, M Michael, might not be aware of all the operational elements behind behind what we're doing, but yeah, we're we're moving globally to kind of a pure paper option to get away from it. I will say about just about the egg now. I think it's really important when we when we think even it's interesting language the word the egg there is a one of my scientists named Camilla she has backyard chickens um, and her backyard chickens lay eggs okay that's an egg um, and then her eggs those eggs actually taste really good and then there's the 1.3 trillion eggs that are laid every single year 99.8% of them, of which are laid by chickens in cages so small, they can't flap their wings, seven, eight crammed in. That's a different deal, you know? Um, and, and again, what I've realized is those egg companies that are doing all that, if they can make more money by getting those chickens out of the cages, they're going to get the chickens out of the cages. If they can make more money selling plants, they're going to make more money selling plants. Those chickens are only in the cages, and that pollution is only going in the river because it's helping them make more money. If they can figure out a different way to make more money, they're going to do it. And if we can help them, we're going to do it, even if we might not agree on everything. Hello. Hi. Um, Okay, I'm going to try and articulate this well. Um, I 
the only thing I, I, I think this is wonderful for, for a start, I think it is a solution on many levels, but I do bump at the point of nutrition because mm. um, I went on my own like food research thing for quite a while because I wasn't sure whether I wanted to become a vegan or not. And it yeah. wasn't ethical for me. It was from a purely nutritional point of view. I actually didn't know if meat was good for me or not. Or I realized that I just actually didn't know that. And I'm fed a lot of things, but I wanted to know for myself. So I went on a, a research thing like with literature and, and different from different people and read about it all and also trial and error. And mm. from what I've found, I feel like I found the best way to eat for me is whole foods, whole vegetables, organic, um, wild meat, um, if I can find it, mm. um, that has not been injected with antibiotics, whatever, wild fish, um, wild caught fish. And from eating it, I know that it's optimal for me. I also mm. know that things like bone broth and uh, contributes to my system in a way that is incredible. And like liver, for instance, is a superfood. So I try and occasionally have that in my diet. Um, so for me, I feel like I know that that kind of chicken and the shit meat that you're talking about and the shit eggs are terrible, but I also know that there's a premium level of what I can actually afford, which yep. I never used to be able to, is probably what's best for me. I wonder where this falls into it. Mm. I wonder if, because for me, like with how stubborn I am and, and with what I've learned about how I like to eat, there is no way I don't think anyone could break down, even if you put antioxidants in the eggs or extra vitamins that you could tell me that my body's going to process that better than the real thing mm -hmm. because to me that's I, I compare that to almost like the contraceptive pill mm. where I think the, the it's it's there to almost do good but it's still a synthetic hormone mm. it still sent me crazy no matter which one I was on mm. um, because it's mimicking it's like putting a square on a circle it's not the real <coughs> thing but ultimately it serves a much bigger purpose that I feel like we should all have access to anyway so I just wonder where this where you feel honestly yeah. this falls on the nutrition spectrum with spectrum with what what kind of meat this is going to be because yeah. for me i'd rather go out to a restaurant when i do want to have a burger and eat that yeah. but i know at home i want to buy my meat that's been grass-fed and organic i want to have my wild fish and i want to eat eggs that i know are organic yeah. and chickens have eaten grass and uh, yeah. i want that because i know i feel fantastic when i eat that yeah. way so all that sounds good, by the way, it's, it's making me hungry. I, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a strange kind of person. I, the only meat I eat actually is that meat, but I really miss meat. Like I, I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not one of these. Um, I won't even, I won't even use the V word to describe myself. Um, <laughs> even now I refuse to use that word, but I, I actually, I hearing you, hearing, hearing you talk about all these meats actually taps in the identity back, you know, being raised in Alabama. But let, let me start off your question by, by challenging the, the egg thing for a second. So the, um, the, the egg is made from a mung bean. Okay. The mung bean has been in the food system since 2600 BC. Mung beans are grown in Tanzania and China and Australia and New Zealand and now North Dakota and Canada. Um, it's about 20% protein, 15% uh, fiber, um, eaten every day in large quantities in traditional dishes like dal in India. What we do is take that mung bean, we mill it into a flour, okay? So now, now you have mung bean flour. And then we take that flour and we spin it down and then the protein, a liquid version of it, is separated from the fat and the fiber and the starch. That, more or less, is the egg. So first I wanna ask you, and I'm, I'm, I'm not offended if your answer is the opposite of what I'm thinking. Does that, what do, you, what do you think when you hear that? So my issue with, the thing yeah. I think of straight yeah. away is yeah. I know that with beans and pulses, the best way to eat them is for them to be soaked so they sprout. Yep. So my first thing is like, that's gonna cause an issue for my digestive system because they're not soaked beans. Uh -huh. 
it's something okay. that you've ground and at the, you know this yeah. is part of the research yeah. I've done like I've now learned that I, I need you. to soak all my grains and pulses and beans before I eat them I because you. my body can absorb it better and get the nutrients from it yeah. better than if I don't yeah. and often that's a huge issue for people they don't even know they're supposed to do that yeah so I, that I would guess, be what I would say I got you I, I got no fair enough more I guess more on the question of like natural versus unnatural it's not uh, the issue for me is not it's natural. not that i got you I got sometimes you. it's Understood. just like that's why I, I like i lean into it i want it i want that and i, I want it. that for people that can't afford it but i got it i got it so on the on the i want to make sure i answer your nutritional question so i in, in a lot of ways i shouldn't be doing this job because i think the most effective thing for people to eat is just whole plant food in a lot of ways, it's crazy that I had to spend well over $100 million in developing this technology for a bean to make an egg. And that, like, my God, just eat beans, you know? Just eat kale. Just eat whole foods, right? I believe factually that that is a healthier way to eat. There's no question. Just like, by the way, I believe that walking to work is better than getting your Tesla Model 3. Right, uh, But I think the world is imperfect, and we require solutions for most people. Uh, now, nutritionally, this kind of meat, the, the big difference between this and call it conventional meat is it's free a lot of garbage, antibiotics, and all that. Uh, from a health perspective, it's more or less the same as, and again, the, the, meat is in the, the meat is still in a laver. We haven't commercialized that. We've commercialized the egg. But at least in what we're seeing right now, it's not better. I don't think meat is the best for you. Right? I even even think that meat that you're eating right now is not the best for you, oh, honestly. But this meat, again, this is the irony of what we're doing, isn't any better for you than, than that meat that you're eating necessarily. I just think the world requires for most people a different, a better solution that is still inherently imperfect. Well, yeah, honestly, I think, I think the nutritional thing are whole plants. That's what I think. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Of so, hi, Josh. Um, thank you. I've really enjoyed this. And um, I, this isn't really a question, it's an observation. And, yeah. um, and since we're here to talk about identity, I'm going to begin by sort of tearing apart the fact that you're American. And, uh, mm. and this is science. And, uh, and what I'm really doing, though, I want to take them the best way possible. This is to help you with your branding. Yeah, because thank you. Because I'm actually really interested in what you're doing. <laughs> I think here, it reminds me of Peter Singer's philosophical arguments, um, speciesism and the idea of, I mean, if it had been left to him, he'd have covered the planet in soya beans and we'd all be eating soya. This, to me, seems like a much more efficient way of feeding people and cutting out the cruelty and yeah. cutting out you know, all the horrors that happen, which is something I feel very strongly about. So I cannot argue with the logic at all. I think it's, it's a fantastic idea. I think a possible difficulty... That here, comes the, here comes the hammer. <laughs> that you, well, I don't know if people agree with me at all. I think a difficulty you may run into in Europe is that um, you've, you sort of present this... In a, in a lovely sort of, reminded, and again, this is not going to sound offensive, but reminded me a little bit of George W. Oh, you know, shit. The way you were like, <laughs> you know, like, there's a problem, <laughs> here's a solution. And I think, I think in Europe, there's a, I'm not a compassionate conservative, Al. <laughs> I, think, I think in Europe, there's this, uh, there's a great mistrust of science and American solutions. Mm. And um, two, two sort of global problems. Mm. Uh, and probably, Got it. probably yeah. some reasons. Yeah. Historical reasons for yeah. that. So I think in terms of, of that, um, one thing that sort of to think about is that um, in Europe, s France, uh, and again, I'm going to cause offense to French people now, but in France, they can be quite comfortable with cruelty. And um, mm. in lots of parts of Europe, people actually, they could see the solution that you're mm. offering. They might actually prefer to resist the solution and actually live with the awkwardness of, you know, whatever hmm. contradictions and difficulties, ethical or, or whatever, exist there, which is why people still eat foie gras and things, um, you know, even if it's cruel or, hmm. if it, that's an example. So... What do you think, what do you think's underlying that? I, th it's, I mean, this, I'm not entirely sure, um, but I think there's, um, 
in Europe, there's still quite a lot of folk tradition and um, allegiances to sort of maybe folk, what we might call folk psychologies, um, magic. Uh, and, and I don't mean that in sort of ridiculous sense, but um, perhaps a fear of um, big science. Mm. Um, no, no, I mean... Big American science, maybe. I, I, mean, I mean more, what do you think is underlying the, the comfort... Not the not not the willful blindness to cruelty, yeah. but the comfort with it. Uh, I think it's living with. I think that sometimes in Europe, people well in Britain, I think you can see it with things like Brexit, and people can actually live with an awful outcome because it somehow it still fits with a particular allegiance. Mm. So even if somebody says to them, "This is going to be bad economically." Mm. They'll say, that's, that's fine. We're very stoic. We can take that. It's right. And so there are conflicting allegiances, allegiances to logic, and to, which is really what you're offering, which is, you know, this is purely logical. This is clearly a solution. But I think actually people will s turn their backs on that, and, and hmm. they'll align themselves with something which may even be illogical hmm. or, and, or conflicting um, for all sorts of complicated reasons. Which I, I'm not sure I've thought them all through. Hmm. So, yeah, I <coughs> just wanted to sort of suggest some of the mm. difficulties here. And it's, and it's a shame in many ways because I actually think it's a fantastic mm. idea. I think if, again, like when we talk, people are talking about how they eat, I, I don't imagine I'm going to probably eat loads of your product. However, if I'm flying somewhere or if I'm eating fast food because it's difficult for me to do anything else, mm. I'd much prefer that there was the cruelty being cut out of the system. Um, mm. Of course I would. And I would much prefer if 10 million people also cut that cruelty out of the system. Do you eat eggs? Uh, yes. Yeah. If it was, let's say in, let's say in two years, mm -hmm. if I gave you a blind taste test um, and you thought the one with a plant tasted better, however you define better, just go with me. That, that's mm -hmm. that if you, and it would whether better, maybe creamier, richer, more umami, however you would define it, if you thought it tasted better. Um, if you knew, and you, you just believed the substance of it, that it was using less land, less water, all that good stuff, right? Um, and it was more affordable, let's just throw that in, with what you're currently eating. Would that be sufficient, or would it still be missing something? Um, well, first of all, I don't think I'd be your target market. <laughs> no, no, but I'm just but, going with you on that. But yeah, but I'll go, yeah, but no. um, I think it would be problematic. Well, no, I think I, basically I'm a problematic person, so <laughs> conflicted person. But I'm, I think I'm what it would that. be is it would, tie in with, <laughs> it would tie in a little bit with what Nell sort of suggested, is that the sort of the connection to landscape is something very important to me. So I don't eat very much protein ordinarily. Um, I mainly eat plant-based. I mean, we're not vegans, though. We, we sort of go sort of Monday to Friday vegans and then feast on some swan or something at the weekend, <laughs> you know. So the idea is, I like, I like the association with landscape and I like the idea of chickens laying eggs and things like that, but I'm very privileged to maybe be able to A, afford to live like that. Mm. Um, what I would absolutely agree with you is that if I'm in a situation where I'm eating packaged food, which I haven't prepared myself, which I very rarely do, it's usually only at airports and traveling, then you can replace all of it with mm. your product. I'd be delighted. I want to try, I want to, try to get at that. You're saying the resistance would be, is it, is it accurate to I say you're saying the resistance would be, it, it, it tastes, just imagine, it tastes 20% better. I think How are you defining it? I don't think it's the taste. I think, I don't think so it's, it's I think a feeling. irrelevant. And I think it's the sense that it's come from a factory. I think it's, it's more the industrialized process of it. I got it. And I think when things come from, you know, industrialized, kind of whatever, however great they are. And I know when you make the comparison with what the food chain is currently doing, that's why I support what yeah. you're doing. I yeah. absolutely support it. Yeah. But if you're not in that system anyway, if you've removed yourself by and large from that system, mm. then why would you opt into um, you know, buying something that's being created in the lab, wherever it was, mm. and then it's packaged and sent to you if you don't, if you don't need to? I so I see it as a solution for... Uh, packaged food, um, processed food, got it. and all of that. Let me I don't let see it as a replacement for. I, I got it. I yeah. just want. I want to just go to you. Want what if if, if we kind of pulled it, pull the curtain back a little bit more, um, and 
you you got a chance to in in some way know the farmers get a sense of their stories who before were growing something that maybe wasn't give them a lot of income and now they're growing something in the field in a landscape right that you can see you can smell you can visit right you can understand and you see that and you see kind of the core process really just milling it into a flower does that change it at all or does simply the fact that you're making a plant into an egg that is enough to create a processed box for you that no matter how many times we highlight the farmers and take you onto that landscape it can never it can never be enough to get out of the process box yeah i'm, I'm not sure i have an answer for you i think probably you might have to hire a French actor to say <laughs> and to talk about your product. And, and, and it would have to somehow find its way into local allegiances and traditions. I mean, I, Got it. Yeah, I that's think, the identity piece, though. That's what you're I, talking I about. I think probably I should be taking a fee for this now because <laughs> I'm going to be solving an issue that I think. But it's right. interesting, though. I mean, that, that, but that's, that's, a, that's, why, that's why food is really interesting to me. Mm. Because it's, it's, there's all these layers going on, you know? And I'm, try, I'm asking this question to try to understand a little bit more. But, I mean, I think that that is an interesting insight to be able to, I'm sure we could figure out a way to reach more people if we figured a way to fit into that. I don't know if it's possible to fit into what you're describing, but I think it'd be compelling. I mean, I wonder whether you don't even need to. I mean, I wonder whether there's, there are so many, sorry, there are so many people that don't question the food system. I, mm -hmm. I wonder whether it's even relevant. I mean, people will go into fast food chains and they will eat tortured chickens that have been wrapped in batter every day and because it's cheap. Yeah. I mean, I think, frankly, you can just change that product. And I don't think anyone will ever ask the question. Yeah. So I don't even know if you need to spend the, spend mm. the money on it. It's maybe just going to be, you know, mm. a, a, at a different societal level mm. that, that you will have objections. I don't, I don't see it in fast food industry. I don't even know if there's that level of scrutiny, hmm. so it probably isn't even an issue. Hmm. So, so moving on to slightly less problematic creatures than Alan. Um, so we have a lot of questions, but I wanted actually our chef for tonight to ask the last one, uh, Helena. Yes, so <laughs> I'm curious about the fact that what, you know, in 2050, the world needs to produce more food than it has produced in the last 100 years. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. And um, considering the fact that we, we don't know where this food is going to come from, um, we, we, we're creating, and we're so obsessed about the food, it's our privilege to be obsessed about food, considering the, you know, the population that don't have actually nutrition, you know, the food to eat in the, in the whole globe. And I think the fact that we have to create things like you have created, which I tasted this morning, and I thought it was probably the first ever product that I've tasted, that I wonder if that product would, that omelette would be served to a guest who, did not, who didn't know that it was an egg. Wow. It was an egg. Thank you. Actually, uh, they would eat it happily being an egg. And I think that, that, is a, that is a progress towards something that we need to find a solution to, to produce food. But what interests me is the fact that what happens in that process when it's actually done? You make it sound so simple that it's just the mung beans are milled into a flour and that's it. Mm, and separating the protein. And then it's piece. separated. Yep. So what happens to the rest of it? So what is, yeah. there, is there a byproduct? Is there something that comes out of that? Yeah. And what happens to that and what is it? So it's a, it, it relates a little bit to the question you asked earlier about, so the, I'll, I'll, I know we got to, we got to, we got to run, but I'll break it apart quickly in 30 seconds. I, I won't make it quite so simple. <laughs> so there's a lot of research and development, screening through the hundreds of thousands of species of plants, looking at molecular and functional and building models to, to more effectively find the plants that we want. Okay. That's kind of step one. Then we found that bean that's been around for a long time and then we grow that bean and then we mill it into a flower, but we have to mill it in a, a particular sort of way. And then once we have the flour, we spin it down. The thing, the thing we spin it down in is called a centrifuge. I wish it wasn't called a centrifuge. That sounds weird. I know. That, that sounds very processed. It's called a centrifuge, specifically a decanting centrifuge. And that spins it down, and the protein is separated, the liquid protein from the fat and the fiber and the starch. And then you're left with the liquid protein. Then we put that liquid protein in something called a spray dryer. 
and it removes the liquid from it, and we're left with about 93.5% protein. Okay, then we take that, and we add oil and water and turmeric primarily to it. We mix it up, and then hopefully in the future, we put it in a paper bottle. That's it. Now, part of the challenge is for consumers, how I actually think there's a case to be made to go really deep and to break all the pieces out. Because sometimes if you don't, you get the skepticism that you just honestly express, right? However, with some consumers, should I show the centrifuge? I mean, should I sh literally show a video of the centrifuge? Maybe, right? On the other hand, I'm a little worried that if you see the centrifuge, right, you're going to be like, I don't, I don't want to eat food that just came out of a centrifuge. And that's a challenge. And I, I don't know the right way necessarily <laughs> to address the challenge. Um, we actually did, we put out this thing called the 10 steps to make it where we actually kind of did get into all that, get into all of that. Um, I showed it to uh, a, a person at, uh, at, uh, at Pret, um, and uh, I could tell they kind of had a, a negative reaction to, to seeing some of it. And I said, tell me what you're thinking. They said, man, that, that looks a little bit processed. And I said, well, I just want to show you what it is. Anyway, I struggle with how deep to go into it or not. If you, if you think this is the way forward, and this is, this, is, this is matter of fact that we have to be able to produce food in this manner for the future, to feed yeah. all the people in the globe. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's, there will be always a half of it. There will be always in that process that byproduct. And that is something that we don't know what's going to happen with that. And when we are... What more quantities we are producing food in that manner? Mm. What happens to that byproduct? Who is going to eat it? What, is it going to be a waste? What, what, what it's a, in, rather than looking into ourselves in the countries that we're living in, mm. you know, smaller countries like in Nordic countries, I think we should be able to produce all the food for ourselves rather than bringing the cabbage from that Holland or yeah. you know the uh, Holland veg vegetable market is feeding all the countries in Europe these mm. days. And so in a kind of, in a balance of living good life, like many of us here today said, that, you know, looking into ourselves, at the same time, creating good products, and your product is probably very good, but in sense of marketing it and, 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 and creating a correct name for it, Mm -hmm. and making under people understand that it is a good product to eat. It's, it ticks the box. You know, there might be a bird flu one day that there will be no eggs anymore available for years and years to come. So therefore, you will make millions with this product. But the, what's left with it after it becomes uh, protein? Mm. That's, 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 that's my so issue. I, was, I, I, I didn't think I answered directly. So what's left after, all, after that whole centrifuge yeah. deal yes. um, is fiber and starch. Those are the co-products. Um, and that fiber and starch can be used for a number of different ways. It could be filler in food. It could be, mung bean starch is actually used for glass noodles, as an example in Asia. Um, and along with the need to move to paper. Um, Michael, you know we're moving to paper, man. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good, uh, but we, we need we need to figure out we need we need we we need to, he's an amazing guy. We we need to fi we need to figure out a way to to uh, to get them out so it, so it's not a waste. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There you go. I, I wish it was all, well. There's only there's only about twenty eight percent protein in the mung bean. Okay, so uh, two more things before we wrap. So first of all, we're working really hard to get you some just chicken, uh, hopefully in time for tonight. So the brave among you, I've already tried it. I thought it was wonderful. Um, the brave among you can hopefully try it tonight. Um, and uh, secondly, just very very last question: um, by twenty fifty, what percentage of meat? that we'll be eating is cultured meat, clean meat, whatever? Mm. I think in the next two decades, the majority of the meat made on the planet will not require a single animal to die. And as a consequence of not requiring a single animal to die, 
we'll have restored the soil, we'll have mitigated emissions, um, and I think we'll have lived a little bit closer to our values. So I think by 2050, you're going to have a world in which 80, 90 percent uh, of the meat um, uh, on menus didn't require killing an animal or be, be cultured meat. And I think you'll have 10, 15 percent that will be a combination of plant-based or um, some of those uh, high-end uh, cows and swans uh, <laughs> eaten by Alan. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful uh, vision and hope for the future. Thank you so much, Josh. For being Thanks, Jacob. Thank you.